Thank you very much. Um, and um, good morning, everyone. It's nice to be to be back here and to again attend the agri 4 c I've been to most of the conferences, but but not all. And it's nice to see how it is progressing over time, and a lot of new people are coming in. So I will talk about towards sustainable land use challenges and opportunities. And the organizers were saying, maybe it will be so many very negative messages today, so can you try to see a little bit of opportunities? And for me, that is actually not so difficult. Um, we'll see if you agree with me. So just a few words about where I'm working now, in case you don't know. ECRAF is one of the 15 centers in the CDR, which is a global research partnership for a food secure future. And our vision is an equitable world where all people have viable livelihoods supported by healthy and productive landscapes, with a mission to harness the multiple benefits trees provide for agriculture, livelihoods, resilience, and the future of our planet, from farmers, fields, through to continental scale. Um, so the outline of the, today's talk, I will start a little bit about the global challenges, and of course you are all aware of most of that. How is land actually being used today? Which are the international agreements which is for forming a good foundation for opportunities at regional and national and, and local scale? And then I have sort of three key messages which I will elaborate a bit on towards sustainable land use. I think there are sort of three prerequisites, you can call them. The first is that we need a sustainable intensification and diversification of the land use and think about multifunctional landscapes. Um, the second one is that we need to further develop the public-private people partnership, both for developing innovations, value chains and markets, and the previous speaker was also into that. And the third one, really to be able to, to, to go to scale, we need to go into the policy domain, and for the land use sector, we really need to bridge the agriculture-forestry divide in policy and practice, because it's very much silos. It's causing a lot of, or many of the, of the issues we have with the sustainable or non-sustainable land use, because it has to do with people's rights, it has to do with conflicts uh, and other issues, and, and we need to go into the policy. And then a little bit future perspective. So starting with the global challenges, um, as we all know, there's an increasing demand for food, fiber, and fuel. And there is high pressure on land, which I will elaborate on, but of course also on fresh water, biodiversity, and other natural resources. And it's not only that we have a growing population, the population become more wealthy, and the, the change in, um, in consumption patterns, the increased demand for livestock and dairy products are also accelerating the pressure on natural resources. A big share of the population would need more of that, but we might also be a big share of the population maybe not needing it, and it all causes uh, part of the pressure. And, uh, and in addition to this, we have the climate change and the extreme weather events, which we face a lot these days. And where we also need to think about it, it's actually very much the, the vulnerable groups would be the poor people in the dry areas and in coastal zones being very, very much um, hit by this. Uh, this re relates to, I think, one of the slides uh, we saw before. This is just to, to remind everybody that the population growth that we expect to 2050 is not at all evenly po distributed, and that is sort of mainly Africa still going up by its plateauing for many other countries. But as I say, it's not only about how many people, it is about the development, the lifestyle, but also the whole urbanization, industrialization, that, that is creating the pressure. So I wouldn't say the number of people is sort of, it's not at all the only concern. It, it is a bigger picture. So land resources are under pressure, and I just wanted to show you a little bit how it, how it can look like in northwestern Vietnam, where the forest is cleared now for maize monocropping, and I will come back to that. Before it was forest, but it was also a slash and burn system. We have northwest Kenya, which is a grazing area with heavily grazing, uh, dry conditions, soil erosion. We have the southern Philippines, which I also will come back to with a huge deforestation and land degradation, which we usually don't talk so much about. So pressure on land for, for different products, 
so say, lead to deforestation and land degradation. And it can be a little bit different mechanisms. Um, it's everything from actually having something to, to sell to the city. Uh, this is from Sub-Saharan Africa, where, as we saw in previous presentations, a lot of the young people are still in the urban, uh, rural areas, but they need to earn some living, and charcoal production is one of those. And the thing would be to see how can, can that be done sustainable, or is it by default not? But there's very much smallholder farming in different parts of the country that has caused this pressure on, on land. Going back to the, to the Vietnam example, and actually which is an example all across the uplands of, of Mekong these days, it's large-scale contract farming on smallholders' land that are causing this type of, of monocropping land use. Here it is all maize. You can come to another place, it's all cassava, it can be all banana, it can be all rubber. It's still the smallholder land, but the contractors are coming in, giving them money, and um, this is the results. It goes well some years, and the productivity is really going down, and it's also not very profitable these days, which is a good basis for change. And also to say that, it is, that these are areas all across from Vietnam to Myanmar where the ethnic minorities live. So they also have those aspects um, when it comes to the, to the upland land use and the government sort of letting these um, things happen. Looking into the case of the um, Philippines to get a feeling for the huge land use changes that has been happening. You can see from 1900, it was 70% primary rainforest in the Philippines. It's a humid, tropical country. You can see how it has been going down 1920s, and very much uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, going down to 18% around the year 2000, and it might be up to 20% again now. So, so what is that have happened? It's easy to say it, it's slash and burn. It is far too easy to say that. Um, it's only a very, very small part. Uh, of course, it's, it's large-scale logging. And when I try to read those publications, it is a combination of legal logging, illegal logging. So if we see what, uh, what Philippines say that they exported to Japan in 70s, 80s, Japan said that they imported 250% more from Philippines, and Philippines say that they exported to them. And it was the same machinery used for the legal and illegal logging. So it was corruption on all, all the levels, uh, military, police, government, farmers, and, and uh, also the, the loggers. And of course, the secondary forest came in, slashed and burned came in. Um, but it's not so that most of it is like vital agricultural land, a lot of plantations. No, a, a lot of the fo deforested land is uh, imparata grassland or other not very much used um, type of vegetation. So, so it's a lot of effort going on to try to work with reforestation smallholder farming or even uh, more large-scale farming in the uplands. But again, especially the government initiatives are not um, too um, uh, successful, are not going too well, even if it's a lot of money going in there from Asia Development Bank and from everywhere. Uh, just so that was just some examples to, to give you a feeling for um, the, the pressure the land is under. And there are many more countries than the ones I gave example from. So if we look at how we're actually are using the land today, if we have 13 billion hectares total, about 4 billion, a little bit less, is forest land, 5 billion is agricultural land. Uh, and, and the rest would be mountains and deserts and, and lakes and tundra and, and other things. Uh, but if you look at actually how the agricultural land is used, so the major part is pasture land, uh, and some of it is cropland. And I think that's an interesting thing to remember. And just, I mean, I think you all know where the things are, but the, the dark green here would be the, the forest areas. And this map actually shows the, the pasture and cropland and how it is spread over the world. Um, and of course, I mean, there are changes between this, people going into more agropastoralism, but also with more people and higher pressure in areas where it has been mainly grazing, adapting to the, to the rain and the availability, settling down and starting to do cropping, with, with not enough water for rainfed agriculture has also contributed to, to, to the issues we are having. So agriculture, of course, has been taking land from forests, 
uh, at the same time, the population has been growing. So this is a combination, but the, the result is, of course, that it's less forest areas globally per person, which also uh, matters. But trees are not only in forests. And uh, I think this is also, when looking at opportunities and how we move forward, an interesting thing to look at. So this map shows the tree cover on agricultural land, so the forests are not here, and you know, the land use is usually classified like uh, in, in political systems, so the governments know what is classified as forest land and what is agricultural land. It can be forest land with new trees, and it can be agricultural land with a lot of trees. And this is how it looks like, and you can see that there are areas with with 15, 20, 30, even more percent co tree coverage, even in the agricultural land areas, in which, of course, a lot of that would be the grazing land. So 43% of the land had at least 10% tree cover, which is the forest definition of FAO, and 23% at least 20%. And looking at the data comparing year 2000 with 2010, it has actually been increasing in most countries, and in some of them significantly. And there are three countries listed here where it's a significant decrease during the 10 years period, with Myanmar, Sierra Leone, and Argentina, with the two firsts uh, having a lot of political transitions. Argentina might be having to do with big um, uh, crop uh, production entities. So what about the global future? How to restore the land health to produce quality foods and other products for more people on the same area of land in a changing climate and then make it accessible for all, because I think this is really what we, we want to achieve. Um, the world has really got together the last couple of years. Before that, it looks a bit dark, but in especially 2015, a lot of things happened. We got the Sustainable Development Goals. We got the Paris Agreement on the climate change. And we also, a bit earlier than that, had the bond challenge on land uh, re restoration. And they all sort of go together and work together. And this is actually a very, very good basis for regions and countries um, to build on. And we discussed, the previous speaker discussed just how the SDGs relate. And here I've been choosing, and I just said in the coffee break, that to just to discuss SDG 15 is not enough for me because it's always about food production, it is about the people, and here I only mention number one, but usually number one and two has to go together with the others. They are interlinked, but I think it's a bit unfortunate that they are not like built up in a little bit of a different way. Um, the bond challenge that people might know less about that than the other two has been an agreement uh, to restore 150 million hectares of world's deforested and degraded land by 2020, and 350 million hectares by 2030. That's huge com commitments. And what do you mean with forest landscape restoration? It is to restore the ecological integrity to improve human well-being through multifunctional landscapes where agriculture is a part. So it's not to take everything back to where it one, one time were. There might be areas where we want to have conservation, national parks, and so on. But restoration is to restore the functions. And I think that's very important. It's important for the continuation of, of my talk. And, and then from the overall global bond challenge, the different continents are now putting up sort of promises. Asia, Africa have been putting up promises, Latin America, and so on. And then down to, to country level to commit how, how many hectares to, to restore. And just an example, how they can be taken forward and implemented. And if you recognize these flags, they are for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, which is sort of the EU of Southeast Asia, where, where I'm working now and where we are quite engaged. And uh, they have formulated a vision for food, agriculture, and forestry. They're going together. And, and they are writing, like, there are really three, dr three drivers of change. The economic growth, the integration and globalization, but it also the pressure on the natural resource base, including climate change. It's so... Um, I mean, the, it's so important, and everybody feels it so much in Southeast Asia, so it doesn't matter how much you are into business and economics, you just can't hide for, for, for the fact. And I'm not going through uh, really the priority areas for the ASEAN cooperation, but I just wanted to highlight to you so you can see a little bit how the countries are thinking. 
So it's both about quantity and quality of production. It's ensuring food security, but there is also food safety and nutrition big issues. And then increased resilience to climate change, natural disasters and other shocks, where, for example, exp expanding the agroforestry systems uh, is one important uh, measure. Also, of course, um, supporting small and medium enterprises, strengthen the collaboration and promote sustainable forest management. So you can see that there is a political will uh, and the member states come together quite a few times a year like in agriculture sector, in forestry, to, to take this forward. And, and we are supporting and CIFOR are also working with them as two uh, knowledge partners and there are three other organizations as well coming in as experts trying to do things. And one thing we are writing just now, there are agroforestry options for ASEAN with a number of policy briefs. And I will go to Cambodia next week to support with the roadmap development for agroforestry in Cambodia wi with my uh, Vietnamese colleagues and with Cambodian colleagues. So coming into how I think we should work towards sustainable land use and the three different points I raised in the beginning, I will elaborate a little bit on each of them. So the sustainable intensification and diversification, which can be mul multifunctional landscapes with trees. And here, as I said, in Vietnam, the productivity has gone down. So the farmers have lost the interest. The provinces have a little bit lost the interest in these big plantations. You know, they don't eat the maize. The maize is exported for animal feed in China. And when the Vietnamese now start to diversify and say, we want to grow things for the, for the market, for the export, but we are very much also their own citizens, of course, then the companies move to, move to Laos, move to Myanmar, uh, and further away. So, so it is for the, for the urban domestic market, can also be for, for the export, as I was saying. And it's very much integrating the livestock with the, with, with the crops and the trees. And here it also required quite a lot of, of research, because in the past it was talking about land conservation, making uh, terraces to, to save the rivers downstream. But farmers wouldn't be motivated to do that. So now it has to be high value products to be produced. And that's why it's very much fruit trees uh, th that is being produced. And the fodder grass, since they want to expand the, the livestock production. And I can talk much more about the research in another meeting. But you can see that going from those small demonstration trials on farms up to, to the whole landscapes, where farmers who want to join are joining in and, and, and get the tree seedlings and the grass, and, and in this way starting to change the whole landscape. This has gone a couple of years since this happened. And it's a co-investment actually between the project, between farmers and between the government who are investing in this. And it's now happening in, in three different provinces. And it's first when things start to become at scale, it attracts a lot of attention. And in the next step, even the, the forest parts, which are supposed to be on the top of the hills, will be part of, of the follow-up project, mainly funded by the, the Australians, but also by the... CDR research program on food agriculture and forestry. Other examples where really diversification and sustainable identification are needed would be Myanmar, where for the moment people are leaving to, to Bangladesh, but we also have to remember there's still other people who left before to Thailand, now on the way back, and as you see the landscape here um, needs a, a lot of uh, attention. The second point was that say that is requiring public-private people partnership for developing the innovations. And uh, here it was both the investment in the exemplar landscapes. It is also that actually the provinces in Vietnam have implemented a new policy to promote the grass strips, which are the foundation for, for preventing the erosion. And they do it because uh, they, they, people like to have livestock and they think they die because it's too cold in the winter but actually they have too little fodder. So the grass strips have made it possible for, for farmers to increase the number of, of cattle and buffaloes they are having. So that is a part of, of the policy and, and there are some incentives for doing that. It's also contracts with private companies for some of the fruits and the first one is signed for the Sontra or the golden apple and, it, and more will come. So it's really a positive development. Uh, another um, aspect would be the smallholder teak in Indonesia 
which I don't want to go into detail, but is also how the, the public-private people partnership has evolved over time. And what enabled this is actually a land reform that farmers were allowed to own the trees, to get the land and own the trees. For why plant a tree if you don't own it? You can't cut it down. That is the case in many, many countries. Um, Another example is the Green Growth Plan for South Sumatra, which is sort of in the provincial level in Indonesia, where there's been a lot of issues with forest fire, uh, peat fire, and also declining productivity in rubber in the different products they are producing. And where the governor was saying that we need to do something about that. And with international support through the IDH, which is a combination of country and the private sector investments, and a green growth plan has been developed with I between ICRAF and the government. And this is really the first master plan for renewable resource-driven green economic growth. And that was launched at the first Asia Bond Challenge high-level meeting. But we're actually, when Indonesia should have told wh what they would invest and what do for the Bond Challenge, but they got some political issues, so the minister cancelled her appearance the last minute, and they have still not committed anything. Um, and that is what's happening. But at least um, the Green Growth Plan is there, and now it's a lot of negotiations with private sector to make investments, to make things happen. And I will talk more about this in the parallel session. The last one is to bridge the agriculture-forestry divide in policy and practice. And coming from Sweden, you might not really understand how serious and severe this is in different countries, and that's also something for another uh, session, because here half of the forests are owned by people and by farmers. That is not the case. In most countries, it's owned by the state, and they give concessions to the companies. People live there, but have very little rights. And these are just some examples, um, where India is the first country to adopt an agroforestry policy, uh, and doing it in that way, the ASEAN, uh, asking for an agroforestry guideline that we presently are developing with them. Thailand has been early out, and this nice picture is from Thailand, where they really have had community forestry schemes engaging people in forestry for many years. Vietnam is revising the forestry law to include agroforestry, which means people's sort of rights to, 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 to be involved. And Indonesia has put aside or committed 12 million hectares for what they call social forestry, which also means community engagements in forestry. And they do it because they think it can be a way to resolve conflicts on land rights, which has caused all the fires and which caused a lot of poor productivity. This is just um, Rita Sharma, who should have been here today, um, uh, um, but got uh, un unwell. And I hope she can come another time and really talk about how they were working to, to get the national agroforestry policy in place in India to bridge between the agriculture and forestry. It's a big undertaking, it's a big country, and they established a new commission, while other countries usually try to do it within agriculture or forestry, and some actually already have combined ministries. So to conclude, um, sustainable intensification and diversification in multifunctional landscapes for food, nutrition, security, and improved livelihoods is sort of a must. We don't have more land to take. We cannot take more of the forest land for the, for the food production. We need to look at forestry and agriculture uh, together. And also, I mean, from the farmer's perspective, the fishery and, and the aquatic sector that I have not been touching in this presentation. We need to, to work with the public-private people partnerships for developing these things, because we need investments. As researchers, we hesitate a little bit to deal with the private sector. We have a lot of discussions in ICRAF all the time, but in Southeast Asia, that's really where we are just now. And to, to really get somewhere, we need to risk a little bit, learn much more um, how to go about that. And, and there are many who would like to collaborate. Breaching the, the policy divide, and finally, which also the previous speaker uh, had in his conclusion, is work across sectors and disciplines in research, policy, and practice that is really necessary to move towards sustainable land use and green growth. I cannot come and say I only know crop production if I sit in a meeting to discuss something with the country. I have to use all my knowledge and all my colleagues and, <laughs> and books to really try to, to, to bring it forward. And I think all of us 
it's good for us to learn to think a little bit broader. So that was a lot, but uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>